Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining us for our second part of this racial justice seminar, Decolonization and um, Collective Liberation and Intersectional so um, Solidarity. I want to thank Mike um, and Psychedelic Seminars for allowing us to have this platform to have these important discussions. My name is Mohawk, which is actually my chosen name. It's also my legal name. I've, uh, I want to give a little bit of explanation about it. Um, I've had a Mohawk for almost 15 years. Uh, I'm also a non-binary trans person, so it's gender neutral, and I feel it's very specific to my aesthetic and kind of my rebellious demeanor. Um, and I am aware that there is a Mohawk nation, and I'm not claiming any specific culture at all, any indig indigenous culture at all. But with that being said, I am still researching, reflecting uh, to be respectful to these people and not be appropriative. And with that said, I also want to do a land acknowledgement. And I would like everyone to reflect and consider that the lands that we're on are stolen lands. Many of us here in New York City are in Lenape territory. And I also wanted to, um, obviously today is a major holiday for the United States. It's July 4th. Um, it celebrates the independence of the United States. And we'll go a little bit more into that with our discussion today. We have a great panel of uh, experts here with us today. We have Yarela Estrada, Paola Khan, and Danielle Herrera. I myself, again, am Mohawk Green, and I'm gonna be moderating today's discussion. And I also wanna thank our moderators that will be in the chat today, which are Kwasi Aduse and Kat Kanawa. So I wanna start this conversation by first addressing some of the things that came up for, since our last conversation. Um, we had a number of questions that were about what is decolonization and what is collective liberation? And how is this tied into working with psychedelics? So I want us to start off by kind of defining these concepts. Paola, would you like to speak to that or Danielle? Um, yeah, I, I feel I feel like it would be important for us to take a moment to think about what date uh, today is, uh, especially because I think it's really powerful for us to uh, really think about where we're at in the present day in relationship to these cycles, these solar cycles, and what this date has meant um, historically and what happened over 200 years ago. Um, so, um, yeah, I think it's important for us to do our research and to self-educate and to really understand what the uh, goals of the uh, War for Independence were. And uh, it's really important for us to um, do that work and to learn about how it was really a uh, desire for plantation owners to have more self uh, determination and autonomy to uh, expand, uh, to um, take more land from indigenous peoples on Turtle Island, and to preserve uh, the system of slavery uh, that enslaved uh, peoples that were abducted from Africa to uh, be exploited for their labor for the new uh, global economy. So uh, today is not a day of celebration. Uh, we really have to uh, remember that uh, that there was a lot of folks of the African diaspora that fought on the side of the British because the British were the ones who uh, promised them freedom if uh, the British won in this war. So we really have to think about uh, who the most oppressed were at that time. And that's folks who uh, are of the African diaspora, that's indigenous people, that's women, that's uh, gender non-conforming people uh, who were all attacked under brutal uh, extermination campaigns at this time. Uh, so today is not a day of celebration. American independence is tied to colonialism, slavery, land theft, uh, massive forced migration through the transatlantic slave trade. So we really have to uh, start by uh, deconstructing the way we've been taught history. So that's all I'll say for now. Yes, thank you so much for that, Paula. Um, so just to totally reiterate um, and also support everything that is said today is a day of mourning and also acknowledging that this land is not free for many folks. Um, and when I when I think about this in terms of decolonization or answering your question, Mohawk, on what 
how we're defining this. Um, I like to refer to decolonization as a tangible unknown, um, especially in a society that is not possible to become post-colonial. We're sort of a neo-colonial trying to figure out how to actively decolonize, which ultimately is an unsettling, um, and what that what that tangibly looks like. So what do we mean when we say we need land back and what does that refer to when we can't possibly get land back? Um, and so then when it comes down to, especially in, in context of some of these bigger topics, which I'm so glad that all of you are um, joining us from the psychedelic community to talk about what decolonization means in this context, um, but it kind of being like everyday acts of resurgence, everyday acts, every moment acts of, of reclaiming reverence, of returning to the spirit, of returning to the sacred, and how we engage with every minute detail of our involvement in everything um, to bring it, to bring that, that element some soul, some life. Um, I would love to kind of hear more of what you all think about decolonization and what questions you have about it. Um, what what it may look like for you um, and kind of what directions you want to take with this conversation. I'm just going to take a quick look at any questions that have been submitted just in. Are there any folks who did want to uh, chime in about this decolonization concept? I do see a question here that I would like to quickly um, address. Someone said, as an indigenous person in Australia, I am acutely aware that my having more settler pale skin ancestry than other indigenous Australians has made my pathway to access psychedelics easier and safer than it can be for darker folks. Darker folks in the desert growing locations have more access to our native entheogen, never illegal, in cities, darker skinned family are struggling a lot with substance misuse, seldom accessing psychedelics. Appreciate it if someone can speak to this issue. Is this something someone would like to talk about right now? Yeah, I, I'm totally, I could pop in with like, really appreciate that question. Accessibility to indigenous peoples when regards to psychedelic medicines is a topic I'm passionate uh, on. Uh, as a psychedelic therapist and harm reduction therapist and an indigenous person. My mother is Chirikawa Apache. My father is Yaki and Hopi. Um, I embody a lot of colonialism with those two tribes being ones that have worked, it had history of colonization with each other. Um, but when, when it comes to psychedelics, even I, I even start with the word psychedelic. A lot of indigenous folks don't even, don't consider their plant medicines to be psychedelics. That's not so that alone is like an access concern. Um, and then when we extend this to like psychedelic medicine, psychedelic therapies, psychedelic um, anything, where are we struggling to provide psychoeducation to indigenous communities to provide them the same access to healing um, as everybody else? Um, so yeah, I, it's, it, and it becomes really complicated too in regards to thinking about the, the the studies that are present for psychedelic therapies or psychedelic medicines and their success rates usually have very low um, involvement of indigenous peoples. And that is both the, it's an issue because only 0.8% of this country is indigenous, um, is of, of its indigenous peoples. So oftentimes the studies have no to 0.1% indigenous populations being tested. And then when indigenous peoples are then trying to access these medicines for healing, um, they can't, they struggle with access because they'll get denied because there's only been 1.1% being of people being studied for it. So there's, there's a lot of need for talking about this in the context of how do we provide healing to indigenous communities and provide them with the same amount of access as um, everybody else. Um, and I'd love to hear your, everybody else's thoughts on that. Um, Danielle, could you actually give us a, a quick intro? You did mention a little bit of your background and as others, um, after Danielle has finished, I would like to hear from Paula and your relatives as well, um, their background so that our audience is aware. aware. Yeah, for sure. So um, I like to speak uh, anti-capitalistly. So before I talk about the work that I do, I like to tell people who I am as a person. First of all, I'm a poet. Uh, I'm a second of all, I'm an, I, I, work with Tarot. I like to um, spend time with my family and my loved ones and animals. And 
I am super passionate um, about the fields that I am working in. Um, I am also indigenous. Like I said, I'm Chicago, Apache, Yaki, and Hopi, and uh, Filipino as well, my mixed ancestry. What I do for work is also something that I'm really passionate about. I'm a harm reduction therapist with Harm Reduction Therapy Center in San Francisco, um, which provides community mental health services on the streets of San Francisco, and it's phenomenal. I love it. It's very non-traditional psychotherapy. Um, I also work with Sage Institute for Psychedelic Therapy, which is the first ever low income psychedelic clinic in the Bay Area, which provides low income sliding scale therapy for folks trying to access ketamine assisted psychotherapy and MD MDMA assisted psychotherapy once it becomes um, legal. So that's the work that I do. I do a lot of integration work. I work with medicines um, and I talk a lot about indigeneity. So that's the background I'm coming from. Thank you. I'd love to hear from Paola next. Hi everyone, my name is Paula Graciela Khan. My pronouns are she, they, and I'm decarceration strategist at Freedom for Immigrants and co-founder of Cosmovisiones Ancestrales. And um, Cosmovisiones Ancestrales is a pan-indigenous mutual aid collective that advocates for indigenous rights and environmental justice. Uh, my early politicization in decriminalization and decarceration was shaped by black and brown community organizers that initiated the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, Dignity and Power Now, the LA Sheriff Civilian Oversight Commission, and the Justice LA Coalition. I'm an herbalist and I study the use of psychoactive substances. And fulfill, um, my lineages on my mother's side are of uh, Guatemala, uh, of Olintepec, Quetzaltenango, Guatemala, and um, of the Iberian Peninsula uh, through colonization. And uh, on my father's side, uh, we're German Jewish folks. I'll, I'll turn it over to Yarelix Estrada so that they can introduce themselves. Thank you. Uh, my name is Yarelix Estrada. I use she, her pronouns. I'm currently on Seminole land uh, because of displacement, because of the pandemic. Every, you know, people are doing things that they probably usually wouldn't do right now. Um, I am a first generation Central American. Um, and I'm a, I'd say the biggest thing that I am is a harm reductionist and harm reductionist in all sense for all drugs, for all things that are risky that we all do. Um, so I currently work as a city research scientist for the New York City Department of Health and my primary duties there are is doing community-based research and also doing community-based outreach uh, for overdose prevention for people who use drugs and part of that is also trying to fill in the gaps or trying to shift the major structural issues that we have that tend to be abstinence-based for people who use drugs and shifting them to a more harm reduction um, structure. Um, I'm also an organizer with the New York City Psychedelic Society, um, and that's a community-based or like society or whatever that um, is trying to build community by inviting folks in that are interested in psychedelics and also being intentional about learning about the intersections of psychedelics with all of this other stuff, all of social justice and um, accessibility for all people. Um, I also organize psychedelic integration circles. One of the integration circles are public, when any, which anyone can come to. And the other sets that I do are specifically for people of color to offer a safe space so people can come and share their experiences and um, yeah, be in a safe space with one another. So. I'd also like to give a little bit of my background. Um, once again, I'm Mohawk Green. My pronouns are they, them. Um, I'm an outreach coordinator with Dance Safe, which is a 501c C3 harm reduction uh, organization that mostly centers its service and outreach in nightlife, festival, kind of like more entertainment, social spaces, working mostly with what would be considered, you know, like quote unquote recreational drug use, um, which is like a very, like the largest population of people who use drugs um, versus, you know, those who may have a uh, substance use disorder or something like that. So we're working with more of the people who are partying with substances or maybe just experimenting with them. I'm um, also the president of the local chapter, uh, New York Dance Safe, 
um, and we do a lot of our out their outreach of Dance Safe here in this local community. I'm also the technical program manager at Next, Next Harm Reduction. They are an online um, mail-based um, harm reduction service. So through nextdistro.org and through next uh, naloxoneforall.org, you can actually basically have um, any anything you could you could get at a, a local syringe exchange, especially for for people who do not have syringe exchanges accessible to them, whether it's too far away, or they just you know don't have a car or whatever. You know things are very different outside of places like New York City as far as accessibility. So you know you, you can access um, all sorts of supplies, including the lock zone, for free through this service. Um, and yeah, I also have done a lot of collaborative work with other organizations such as the Drug Policy Alliance. Um, I've worked with other similar nightlife harm reduction organizations around the uh, uh, sorry around the world, not just around the country, um, in like Amsterdam and um, in Belgium and multiple places. I like to get around and see how everyone's doing harm reduction in these types of spaces all over the world. South Africa has probably been my favorite, just as an aside. And also do a lot, I have like an online platform where I've done probably the majority of my work um, because that's how I started before getting more involved with formal organizations. Um, you know, being able to reach people through social media. And um, yeah, that's it uh, for us. I believe we can kind of transition into another topic here. I saw that there were some questions, but I think I'll hold off on those for just a second while I look through them and we can talk a little bit more about coming out of this decolonization and um, intersectional, or sorry, this is decolonization kind of topic and into intersectional solidarity um, and how that's important with the psychedelic community. So anybody want to take the floor on that first? And just FYI, I feel like it could also overlap with, there was a question that asked, can decolonization and capitalism coexist. I know Danielle's an anti-capitalist. I would identify as one myself. If we feel that that has to do with intersectionality, I'd love to start going off on that. For sure. Um, actually, I wanted to, to start off with, I, I wanted to acknowledge that Camille isn't here. Um, and uh, our warmest wishes to Camille, there was an emergency in their space. So just to acknowledge their absence and their constant present with us, um, all their love. Please sh share the, all the love to them as you can. Um, in regards to the question, I also totally wanna hear from Yadalex and Paula on this, but I am also definitely an anti-capitalist. And you know, the question of can decolonization exist in, with capital, uh, capitalism is fascinating um, in, a weird, in a strange way. Um, and I'll share this article, but decolonization is, is something that people speak a lot to, um, but must be understood as, as, it's, as not just a metaphor, it, we speak to it so easily, but it is, um, it is, it's complicated because we are trying to decolonize, yet it's ultimately not possible in the land that is colonized. So ultimately it becomes a, a frame of mind in which we have to um, constantly be engaged with. Um, and in regards to capitalism, I think of, you know, I was just thinking about how, you know, I try to decolonize psychotherapy in many ways. And yet in this context of psychotherapy, being a business, being healing and wellness, being, um, businesses being, um, there, there's, there a way in which you're, you are involved with them. Um, and your like pathology ultimately ends up benefiting the system. So if we're trying to decolonize a system like that, we need to be really um, intentional about not continue to, continuing to perpetuate um, white settler colonialism that's embedded within those systems. So um, yeah, I'd love to hear more on like kind of the, the wider thoughts about this, uh, but not to take up too much space on this topic, but it is, it is a complicated one. Thank you. Yeah, um, so uh, last part one of this series really talked about colonization and a system, a global system of extraction 
And there was some backlash that, you know, we've received from part one of this series, folks who are saying that there is no evidence for systemic oppression and that intersectionality is an ideology that is divisive. And so I think we really have to get clear on a few things that um, we're still living within uh, these systems of extermination. And that's why um, some of us may not be perceiving them because uh, they've become normalized. They've become a part of our everyday life. And um, it's really hard to see it from inside um, when you're not experiencing it yourself. Um, so when talking about how uh, colonization and capitalism are related, uh, so with the forced enslavement of both folks of the African diaspora and of indigenous people, people of the global majority, uh, we have to talk about how uh, substances that were previously used as sacraments ceremoniously were uh, recontextualized and recodified into these systems of forced labor, of exploitative labor. So um, you see um, in different um, plantations or haciendas or labor camps, the use of um, coca leaves to uh, try to maximize the amount of product that uh, enslaved peoples produce for the colonizers when uh, previously uh, the coca leaf was used in ceremonies to connect with um, certain groups deities. We see this um, more in Abya Yala, which is what is commonly known as South America, more in the Incan, what was formerly the Incan empire, the use of coca um, for forced, for producing the maximum product under forced labor. Um, then in the Caribbean, uh, we see the use of cannabis uh, and alcohol um, to also, uh, again, yield as much product as possible, but also because people are suffering so much from being separated from their families, from seeing massive death, uh, people are um, suffering. Um, so these substances uh, allow people to uh, work to continue working and to cope with their situation. Um, so um, you see cannabis, caffeine, uh, alcohol, uh, coca leaves, um, and I'm sure I might be missing sugar as well, uh, being forced upon populations. So I think it's really important for us to recognize that um, there was a corruption of folks' um, consciousness as um, forced labor was imposed on people. And we see that. I have a theory that um, that plays into substance use disorders, uh, substance dependency um, that is uh, transmitted epigenetically sometimes. I believe that it's because of those early traumas of uh, being forced to consume substances in this context of uh, genocide. Um, so I'll leave it at there for now, could say more, but I would love to hear from uh, my colleagues. Yeah, thank you for that, Paula. And I think um, sometimes I, I think from the conversations that I've had with people, it's difficult to maybe uh, conceptualize colonialism as something like it, for some people it may just sound like a concept, right? Like it's something that they read in a book that happened one time when someone came to the US and like killed some people and it's not happening anymore. But in reality, that's what we're, that's what this country is built on and that's what we're living in. Like capitalism is successful. Capitalism is able to happen because there are people at the top that are benefiting from this colonialism. And so what does that look like? That looks like billionaires that could probably fund the the people who are living in poverty so that they can like get out of that poverty but not and instead saying i'll give you eight dollars an hour to work for me and that'll be enough to to keep you going but that's it's not um and so i i'm also anti-capitalist i think colonialism and capitalism are, t are tied also because capitalism tells you that you're an individual it tells you that you don't have a community or we're you know every man for himself type of um, type of mentality and that's not what we should be aiming to do in my opinion so like if if we're thinking about how we support each other um, how we uplift each other's voices and how we care for one another like the people that are most marginalized are often people that have been oppressed by the system and these are like like was mentioned um, people from the African diaspora indigenous people and are being oppressed now by not having access to uh, resources being in places so for example just thinking about how um, zoning works in this country for example like you see people that are in communities of color they get 
like shit. Like they don't they don't get good uh, educational systems. They don't get access to food. They live in food deserts. And this is all intentional. It's all intentional because of histories of redlining. And and this is all part of that historical process that the white people from like not that long ago decided to do. Um, so yeah, I agree with everything that everyone has said and, and just acknowledging that we're living in colonialism now and we're living in white supremacy right now. Absolutely, just to like add on that, um, you know, I think colonialism is often thought of as just something that's, that's a part of history when it's actively a system that is, uh, that white supremacy is benefiting from and everybody else is not. Um, and then I also want to acknowledge that with whiteness being this this lie that you were told, right? There's a, there's a it's a the 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 lie the construct of race that is truly not betting, benefiting anybody in society. Yet, like capitalism being this tool to convince people that you alone can become a certain role, like you can become as rich and powerful as Trump himself, um, with and and do this by disconnecting yourself from your communities that's a colonial mindset, right? And we see this entrenched, I saw there was a question similarly, we see this entrenched like within the psychedelic community, even it, even seen in, in these very well-meaning cultures of healing and wellness of like, okay, well here, take this MDMA, take this psychedelic, take these, um, these this, go through the psilocybin experience and experience, um, establish a, a greater sense of empathy and wholeness being all one. And that's something to be really careful with, because in that in that place of being all one, we um, we tend we could we have the possibility of spiritual bypass, where we are disconnected from the acknowledgement of the harm that we are capable of, and the fact that we are still individually and collectively responsible for deconstructing capitalism in the ways in which it harms everybody, and decolonizing and unsettling in every way that we possibly can. So that's something I'd, I'd also like to pull into the into the picture of. You know, I, I do believe in psychedelics being like the place where we can um, do a ton of healing for our collective liberation. And, and that could be a place where the new world is possible, where we are all one. But ultimately that um, it, it that sort of like cloaks us from the responsibility of, of the responsibility and the potential for harm. Um, and to build on that, uh, when we are talking about decolonization, we're talking about moving away from uh, systematized, meaning that the governmental institutions have created the infrastructure and, pa and pass laws to sustain an infrastructure that normalizes extermination. So we have to understand that colonization is a culture of extermination. Colonization is genocidal culture and genocide is the extermination of a people's. Ethnocide is the extermination, the systemic extermination of their culture, uh, cultural identity. Uh, so thinking about um, how when um, European colonizers ravaged uh, places around the world, they destroyed texts, they burned texts, they destroyed temples, they destroyed sacred sites, they destroyed ritual objects, they targeted spiritual leaders. That was done systematically, that was done by design to stupefy a peoples and to kill the elders is to disconnect people from knowledge, especially in cultures where knowledge is transmitted orally. So when we talk about decolonization, we're talking about healing from that systemic killing of culture, from the systemic disconnect of our ancestral knowledges. Uh, we also have to talk about how colonization is entrenched in uh, misogyny and the targeting of um, of uh, gender nonconforming people, two spirit people, um, females, females. Uh, so we talk about femicide too. We talk about the sexual violence that was uh, central to the colonial project that we continue to see today with the targeting of uh, black trans folks, with the targeting of trans folks being the most vulnerable people in our society. So when we talk about decolonization, we're talking about freedom for everyone. And we're really analyzing who have been the most targeted historically. 
Um, and so we're also talking about ecocide. Right now, we're in a climate crisis. We really can't afford to continue the patterns of extraction on this planetary level. Um, so when we're talking about decolonizing, we're talking about changing a system that is based in extraction and exploitation, uh, the extraction of labor, the extraction of resources from the land. And that's really, that's at the core of capitalism. Capitalism is possible because of the extraction of both resources and labor. The resources came from the colonies, the raw materials of the colonies that were uh, produced by enslaved peoples that were then shipped uh, around the world. So we're really talking about dismantling this global economy that is sourced in the mass extermination of people, culture, resources, and knowledge. All right, thank you for that, everybody. Um, so actually, you know, I kind of want to piggyback off of what Paola and uh, your other were both saying. Um, to a degree about, you know, so we a lot of people tend to like look at this stuff as this is some isolated event that happened in the past since we have like reached something that looks more like equality today. But there's all these like subtle things that are happening that kind of still keep us oppressed in this way. You know, like we were talking about the uh, spiritual bypassing where people aren't really acknowledging the type of harm they can be doing by kind of avoiding these topics that might be uncomfortable, that might acknowledge their privilege and things of that nature. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that are done by design, like for example, in healthcare, um, in our healthcare systems, you know, like even to this day, um, you know, black people are, are still believed to like have a higher pain tolerance or, you know, sometimes women are assumed to be exaggerating their pain. So there's like a lot of stuff that still goes on in our systems today. Um, that make even things like healthcare inaccessible or torturous for people. And with that said, I kind of want to um, segue into talking about harm reduction, like how has harm reduction been colonized itself? Both myself and your relics are really active in doing harm reduction work. Um, it might not be apparent to people outside of this specific movement and that these specific organizations that handle these types of services, how harm reduction has somewhat been colonized and can be seen even as another form of policing. Um, you know, and also, you know, harm reduction is ultimately a healthcare service, it's, you know, like a public health service. It's allowing people to have the right information and resources to be able to make much safer choices um, that concern their health, whether it's physical or mental, you know, that could be how, what they know about a certain substance, how can they access substances that are not adulterated or misrepresented, you know, how much of the substance can they take, what the experience will be, what kind of precautions should they take, should, you know, especially when it comes to things like psychedelics, you know, set and setting are like really important um, considerations when using these types of substances. So I would like to kind of get into an overall topic of like, how is harm reduction colonized? And also like, how is psychotherapy colonized and, and maybe any other forms of uh, our healthcare system? And honestly, I can start with that. Um, <laughs> I, in the beginning, you know, as part of my introduction, I mentioned that I, I work with a mail-based um, syringe exchange type service that does ship out supplies. Um, that you could normally find in a, in a syringe exchange, including things like naloxone, you can get those things for free. So Next Harm Reduction was basically founded on the principle that harm reduction is colonized. A lot of the existing programs tend to address the white population. It's not the most marginalized population. It's not reaching the BIPOC communities. Um, and for people who are not aware, BIPOC stands for Black and Indigenous People of Color. Um, you know, these are some of our, our, our most marginalized communities of color that are not that are not able to access these resources that are life saving. Um, you know that can create stability, especially since in our current in our current society, you know a lot of a lot of our wealth has been stripped away generationally, like historically. I mean, I can speak you know, for, with, with the black community that 
any time that there was wealth built within the community on our own, it was destroyed. You can look back to things like Black Wall Street, where you know there was like a whole thriving community, and due to an incident where you know a racist incident, they decided to go burn down the entire community. Or, for example, here in New York City, um, Pros or sorry, uh, Central Park used to be a thriving community full of Black people called Seneca Village. Um, they had multiple schools and churches. You know, I think it had a 300 and something person black population. And basically all of that has been wiped out and now it's just a giant park in the middle of Manhattan. So, you know, we have been stripped away of these resources to thrive and in some, some way sustain. And there's also been things like crack leaking into our communities. People who are, um, people who lack resources, um, tra have traumas, you know, there's a high rate of some sort of, sort of trauma, some of that, some of which is also intergenerational. And with those traumas, I believe I said it in the last seminar that trauma is the, uh, well, maybe it was actually on another a podcast or something, but trauma has kind of been identified as the gateway drug. Like no, no drug, you know, not marijuana, not, um, you know, alcohol or, anything that you know we identify as like a psychoactive substance but the real gateway to something like a substance abuse disorder or any other kind of like destructive um problematic drug use uh drug patterns is trauma and these communities have a lot of that because of our history and our present day um and so that we we're trying to do a lot of centering of these communities to provide them with access to the resources that you know white or white adjacent counterparts have had for a much longer period of time um and my role at that safe uh is is sort of involved with this as well like that safe is actually a, a national organization and there's chapters all over the country and here you know every chapter might do something a little bit differently because it might depend on what their community needs here in New York City, we have an extremely diverse population. We have a huge bustling, you know, scene. I don't even want to just say, say specific mu to music, but like, you know, that's what we focus on primarily. And, um, but we have all sorts of cultures here. There's like over 200 languages being spoken here. There's a lot of, um, there's a, it's a big melting pot. So, you know, we really do have to address more than just what would be considered like the majority population outside of a place like New York City. And not just racially, a marginalized, marginalized community, like I said, I'm a non-binary non trans individual. The LGBTQ uh, plus community is heavily marginalized, is stigmatized. Um, and then if you add the layer of, you know, also being, you know, like black or indigenous within that identity, then that just kind of adds an additional layer of being oppressed and lacking resources and access. And so I've been doing a lot of work to try to make sure that these communities that are heavily stigmatized and marginalized are getting, the, getting access to these same resources. A lot of people have no clue um, about even the most, what, what we might consider the most basic harm reduction concepts like testing your substances or, you know, understanding dosing, you know, the dose makes the poison kind of deal. Like, you know, there's a lot of misinformation um, that, that happens in these spaces. They're, they're, they don't have access to the same level of education, like Yarlex was saying. Um, and this is not something that's even be, being, uh, it's not even mainstream education. So if it's not mainstream education, then it's even more obscure for people who lack access to you know, being able to like do a lot of this research, they may not even understand that they can look into debt safe and look into these forums that talk about um, harm reduction, you know, when, when you're using substances recreationally. And, um, you know, to, that I, I think I just wanted to start there because a lot of what my work is revolving around is giving these communities that typically don't have much access to harm reduction who have very high rates of substance use, you know, making sure that they are now starting to get the same resources that everyone else has had, especially considering that they are also the most um, prosecuted, you know, the most targeted when it comes to just even the, you know, policing around drug use since 
the majority of these substances are still illegal um, or scheduled in such a way that, you know, only certain people are able to gain access to it. And uh, yeah, I think, I think I've really said a lot on that. So anyone else feel free to, to jump in on this topic of decolonizing psychotherapy or, in, or healthcare. Yeah, so I wanted to talk a little bit, uh, piggybacking off the things that you said about lack of accessibility to communities of color and things like that. Um, so I work in overdose prevention and o overdose is a huge issue. Like we're having all these different layers of, pen of, of like crises, right? So we're having COVID and that's eviscerating communities of color in big cities. We have uh, the state violence towards black people by police. And then we also have overdose, like the overdose crisis has been happening since 2015. And in the last year, there were nearly 70,000 people that died of a drug overdose. Um, a lot of these deaths are largely preventable. Like they're, they're, if we could distribute naloxone to people that could potentially uh, cause some people to not die because they could reverse their overdoses. Um, but the issues around overdose are largely fueled by the war on drugs and prohibition. So in talk one, uh, the one before this one, there was a lot of conversation about uh, what the war on drugs is, what it looks like. But I'll just say that we have drug laws in this country, not because they are meant to keep us safe. There are drug laws in this country to criminalize us. So there are people that are in government power that said, hey, I want to criminalize Mexican people, make marijuana illegal. Hey, I want to criminalize uh, people that are from Asian countries. Let's make opium illegal because that's a cultural use. Let's make crack cocaine illegal, even though we put it in community in, in black communities um, and then arrest them for it. So like these, these are how these drug laws are shaped. To, in order to, to think that, that we could have a system outside of this is not radical. Like there are other countries that are already doing this. There are countries that don't have schedule one substances that if, you, if, if I find heroin on you, I have to arrest you. Like that doesn't exist in other places and we can fight for that. Um, so I just want to acknowledge that schedule one substances are not deemed that because they are dangerous, because they're proven to be dangerous, like marijuana and psilocybin are schedule one, and so is heroin, and so is meth, and so are these other substances. Um, but I think it's important to talk about, so like the drug war came in and it's ravaged a lot of communities, right? And communities of color, low income people, et cetera. Um, and that has led to economic, uh, like lack of economic stability, it has led to lack of stability within families. And so when people start having issues with overdose and, and when people have issues with overdose, sometimes they are because of underlying mental health issues that come from trauma, that come from trauma that's passed down from a community level, but also on an individual level. Um, and so I work for the Department of Health. That is a very large institution and um, I'm not representing them at all. I am not like, and everything that I say is my own opinion, but I will speak from my experience there that there are policies or there are programs that are put in place and they're like, oh, this is going to work. This is going to decrease the overdose in New York City. And there are they're like small programs that help people that are already housed. They help they help people that um, that are already engaged in some sort of mental health treatment. They engage people that have some of their basic needs met. So then when we when these plans get implemented, and then we see in the new year, okay, what, what has happened? Overdoses in the white communities have gone down. They've gone up in black and brown communities. So clearly these programs that the government is trying to implement aren't working. One, because all the leadership that exists in those organizations are white. Two, because they don't listen to people of color that come in and, and tell them like, these need to be culturally appropriate interventions because if not, they're not going to work. And then we're seeing that there's these huge num spikes in, in overdoses in black and brown communities that continue up until now. And because of everything that's going on with how COVID is destabilizing the economy and how it's destabilizing everything, like there's going to be bigger spikes in overdoses after this. And so drug use is just a way of seeing this intersectionality, right? Because if I'm someone that wants to get drug treatment, like first of all, I may not be able to afford it because it's expensive. Second of all, if I'm someone who's queer or gender nonconforming, I may not feel safe in these like very patriarchal, very restrictive settings. And also if I'm undocumented, I, I can't, I really can't look for any treatment or because I'm afraid of getting deported because the state is trying to, to get me out of the country and, and kill me, you know? And so um, I think like when we're talking about intersectionality, like it's important to think about what factors are working against people 
in order to access services. And and someone asked in the in the chat about how does this relate to psychedelics? Okay, so people people love to talk about all the ways that psychedelics are good for people, right? And how they're helpful and why we should be promoting them. And one of the things that I see is why we should be using psychedelics to help with uh, with overdose, with substance use, right? And so, great. So we're going to talk about overdose and substance and, and psychedelics. So if I'm someone that is undocumented, I am unhoused, I'm queer and gender nonconforming, and I have a substance use disorder because I'm traumatized and I have a, a underlying mental health issues. If I do psychedelics and 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 do it in a controlled setting, and I get some sort of healing because I, I figure out some things about myself that feel like self love, like some of the things that we love about psychedelics, the, the self love, the self acceptance, this unity. But then I get sent back out to be re-traumatized by people that are trying to kill me, people that are trying to rape me, people that are trying to harm me and and not helping me get housed, not helping me have sustainable mental health treatment, not having me um, just be able to be myself in a safe space. What What is a psychedelic really doing? And on the flip side of that, there's a lot of people that use a ton of psychedelics and they don't change at all. They're just, they stay more rooted in their mindsets and because a lot of people in the psychedelic community have contacted us and saying, you're, what you're saying is divisive. And we're trying to understand, like, we're saying that psychedelics could be a modality for healing, but we need to understand every single person that wants access to this for healing because healing looks different for everyone. And if we don't acknowledge that and look into the history of what colonialism is and why people are so oppressed, we're never going to know how to give equal access to everyone, not just people who are, you know, researchers and people who are, are uh, Michael Pollan and people who are like very popular in the media. Like we need to talk about it for everyone if we want it to be true healing for the entire community. I love that Yadi Lex, thank you so much. Snaps forever. Um, to totally kind of bounce off of that, um, you know, just what came up for me was this experience of, um, you know, being somebody who's been in the psychedelic community for a while now, and just actually very recently coming out was had was show kind of shows how white the community is, and I'll, I'll explain why. Um, frankly, it's not safe to be a person of color running around doing a bunch of psychedelics. Let's complain. Let's compare the difference between somebody who is, you know white hippie, totally awesome person, but they've, you know, they're, they're running around their campus on LSD um, and say they're starting to have a, a bad experience. Say they're stopped by uh, campus police. They're in a completely different scenario than if a black person or an indigenous person is having a shared experience that looks pretty much exactly like that. Um, also similarly, like, at, and I'll say this over the internet, obviously, like I do drugs and I need to be able to say that I do drugs. That's, but yet that's a, that's a risk every time I say it because I could be criminalized for my entire life, right? But yet that this, these elements, these drugs are sacred to me. They are, they are what I call my religion um, and they've been embedded in my culture for my entire existence. Um, and it's necessary for us to acknowledge that we don't, we aren't experiencing the psychedelic renaissance in the same place depending on because of this construct of race and because of our um how we could be criminalized like if we really want to like provide reparations for example then we need to pretty much free everybody out of prison right now who is who is being incarcerated for a drug crime and then consider that while you know there's what 970 people here right now and i suppose i'm going to assume that all of you are supporting drug use, psychedelic use, oftentimes not drug use of other drugs. And let's look at that. Why are some drugs not as great as psychedelics? What's happening there? Let's let's play with it, right? But when we get to be home and have our deep internal healing psychedelic experiences and not be criminalized, why we why why are there people who are, you know, for all we're all one, right? If we're all human underneath our skin why are people criminalized then for such low level drug crimes um so this there's a lot on that and and you know i, I do want to speak to um one what this looks like kind of in psychedelic therapy real quickly just from my experience in working with sage institute and we're, we're trying to create something that does not exist which is accessible psychedelic therapy which means 
therapy that could be profoundly impactful both for the integration of psychedelic medicines and experiencing psychedelics um, within therapy to heal years of trauma, to heal like treatment resistant depression. And in order to do this, we're, we've completely changed a model and we're, we have sliding scale. I have a client who I see for $15 an hour because they're a two spirit indigenous person who is not stably housed right now. And that is what we should be doing. We should provi be providing them access with medicines that we, we it, psychedelic medicines exist partly because we're, we've been inspired by indigenous cultures and the way that these medicines have been used for healing. So that's the only thing we should be doing. And yet there's still so many complications, right? Because our wait list is pretty much comprised of primarily white folks who are asking for a lower fee, reasonably so, right? But it's a lot of people who are in the psychedelic renaissance. And so we're, we're complicated, it's complicated. We're trying to figure out who, who to serve with our limited staff as well, right? Like there's very few psychedelic therapists of color. There's very few therapists of color. And we can extend this beyond the whole thing that's like, that therapy in itself is the whitest construct ever. And also like, why do we expect black and indigenous folks to even trust Western medicine when like Tung's Kazi experiment, like we have so many examples of reasons why these Western medical model is has been harmful, right? So, just a lot of things that I'm encouraging everybody to like play with in terms of like what what is my experience with being a drug user? How does my experience look different from 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 yours? From you know my supervisor at harm reduction, who's this radical black man? How does how is his different? Right? This com we can't exist in the same way, um, and we're navigating completely different worlds because of that. Yeah, um, so to echo what my colleagues have been saying, um, this is an access issue. It's not only an access issue, but it's an issue of mass incarceration. So I think it's really important for us to recognize that um, slavery has not been abolished. Um, when slavery was supposedly abolished, um, it was done so um, under the condition, or if someone had committed a crime, then they could be enslaved with the 13th Amendment. So it's really important for us to recognize that we have not abolished slavery. There is still ongoing uh, exploitative prison labor that's been happening that truly amounts to human trafficking. Uh, we don't talk about it enough, but the US is guilty of trafficking humans into prisons and then exploiting them for, the, for their labor, continuing the patterns of extraction for the profiteering of uh, an elite minority. So um, we have to talk about how, uh, because of the 13th Amendment, um, this also incentivized uh, private prison industry to expand during the 20th century. Um, and so we have to talk about, I mean, we're talking about access, but we're also, when we talk about access, we have to recognize that as folks had said in the, in the previous uh, part of this series, that the war on drugs is, uh, is a tool for social control and it's, uh, it's a tool for exclusion. Um, so we have to think about, we have to think about a lot of things, um, that there is a global demand for drugs that is fueled by the global north, uh, specifically the United States and European countries that uh, fuel the demand, not just for um, stimulants and opiates, uh, but also for uh, sacred plant medicine for plantas maestras there is this global demand and yet the global demand is driving the extractive industries is driving armed violence by uh militarized cartels that are actually uh in in alignment politically with uh, the people in power of the countries uh, where cartels are in operation we have to ask ourselves where is that money coming from that funds uh narco dictatorships and that also uh, where do the weapons come from? Who are the weapons producers that are being supplied? It may seem like this is not connected to access to uh, therapeutic decolonized uh, therapeutic models, but it totally is because the waging of war on indigenous communities, on communities uh, of the African diaspora, uh, wage uh, tra trauma in those communities uh, and ongoing trauma uh, keeps people oppressed. Um, so just trying to track all of my thoughts and ideas, but um, 
so yeah, going going back to the US, the US drives the demand for drugs, simultaneously provides the weapons uh, to the narco dictatorships that also get used by cartels um, that wage war on indigenous communities south of the US-Mexico border and really coerces people to be displaced from their ancestral lands so that those lands can uh, be plundered and extracted from. And so folks are put into pipelines of forced migration to the US-Mexico border. And I wanna talk about this because there is a really important history of how uh, the war on drugs is correlated to border expansion uh, with the US-Mexico border and all of the trauma that, ha that has waged on indigenous and uh, mixed communities uh, in, uh, along the border and south of the border. Um, and so when we talk about decriminalizing psychedelics, uh, such as uh, psilocybin, uh, hickory, other, otherwise known as peyote, uh, when we talk about the decriminalization of uh, wachuma, when we talk about the decriminalization of iboga, we're not recognizing or what I've seen uh, really um, uh, stand out as a trend amongst the decriminalized nature movement and other folks that are not looking at this from an intersectional lens. Uh, for those who are not familiar with the term intersectionality, it's a term that was coined by Kimberly Crenshaw, a uh, scholar, a uh, black feminist scholar, uh, who is describing how we experience uh, oppression, power, and privilege uh, as a product of uh, the layering of our identities, including uh, ability, disability, gender, class, race, sexual orientation, how all of these overlapping identities inform how we experience uh, a world under the legacies of colonialism and slavery. Um, so returning back to um, Right, so when we're going into uh, this movement of decriminalizing psychedelics without an intersectional lens, we're really not taking into consideration the global impact of the demand for psychoactive substances. We also have to recognize uh, who are the producers of the poppies that supply the pharmaceuticals, the opiate pharmaceuticals. Are they getting properly paid for their labor? Are they being subjected to militarized violence? Um, so all of these things are are super important for us to take into account. Like what are the rights of coca leaf cultivators? What are the rights of poppy cultivators? Are the laboratories in Europe, uh, in the US, in China, are those laboratories paying rightfully for their labor? What are the economic relationships underpinning uh, that production? And do those folks have access to decolonize uh, therapeutic spaces? And guess what? The answer is no, because they're producing the drugs for the global elite and for people north of the border in Europe. Um, so um, just really wanting to talk more about the U.S.-Mexico border, we'll get to that later, but um, incarcerated peoples do not have access to uh, plant ceremonies the way that folks are advocating uh, for uh, the legalization of. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, I also wanted to just like add a personal experience real quick. So I believe it was Danielle who mentioned something about um, having access to to therapists that are of color. Uh, there's so few, there's like waiting lists. And a lot of us who have been traumatized by people, you know, by, you know, colonizers, do not want to see someone who's, you know, who may have these like racial biases, these implicit biases and things like that. You know, I've had pers many personal experiences with practitioners, you know, whether it's with physical health or mental health, like gaslighting me, or they have very little knowledge on drug use. So I'm often stigmatized. Um, it's very, hard, you know, some people are denied medications that could be used for them in this context if they presume that you're gonna have some sort of problematic use pro uh, pattern with it. You know, so there's like a lot of discrimination uh, in these spaces. And there are a lot of folks, you know, like myself who are, you know, black or of, you know, some marginalized identity like LGBTQ who do not even feel safe if they can even access whether it's affordable, uh, you know, whether it's a financial access or like a geographic access, um, do not even feel safe uh, seeking out these spaces. I, per I currently do not even have um, a primary care physician. I've had to like basically fire all of them. I finally found a black therapist uh, who's also a woman. So I, I, I want to shout out your Alex for that. Uh, for helping me out, my my two year journey for looking for one maybe have has finally come to an end. 
uh, but it's so rare. Um, you know, and I, I want people to understand that this is like real. It's not just, you know, people like projecting or exaggerating. Like this is a very common issue. Um, I've also done like, I've just asked a lot of my friends, you know, what their experiences were with being a drug user in, in trying to seek out healthcare. And when I didn't want to, I don't want to get sidetracked, but like insurance is a whole other thing. You know, if you're being ID'd as like a drug user for any reason, that's not like prescribed drug use, your insurance may go up. If you are, you know, if you're a parent, you might lose your children. It's like all these different things um, that make it very, very difficult for people to access healthcare services. Um, and with that being said, I mean, we've talked a lot about the black and indigenous community, you know, which is basically, you know, these are these people who are citizens of this land. So I'd like to kind of migrate into, you know, transition into the topic of immigration and migrant justice. These are people who do not have citizenship here um, and therefore do not have the same, this, this, well, in theory, the same rights that all of us who have, but may not necessarily actually have, but under the law are definitely denied a number of rights. Thank you. Um, so, I think it's important for us to remember that uh, indigenous peoples have been constructed as aliens uh, during the campaigns of colonization in what is known as the United States. And uh, we have to think about the war on drugs as running parallel to this myth of citizenship because citizenship has been a myth in the history and genealogy of the United States. Uh, citizenship is a construct to exclude uh, the, the ancestral peoples of these lands. And the war on drugs is uh, used as a means to continue excluding people from uh, having their full rights recognized on these lands. Um, so uh, we see that with the Chinese Exclusion Acts at the end of the 1800s. Uh, the Chinese Exclusion Acts uh, set the precedent for uh, the modern uh, detention and deportation regime and some of the justifications for detaining and deporting uh, Chinese laborers that uh, also were forced, coerced to come and build uh, the uh, railroads in the West. Um, uh, there was propaganda that was created uh, to associate them with opium use. This was mentioned during the part one seminar, but just to remind folks in case folks have forgotten or for those who are just joining us for this part. Um, so there was lots of propaganda that was created that um, uh, was to instill fear into white populations that uh, Chinese men uh, were luring white women into opium den dens and were getting them high. And it was uh, a propaganda tactic to justify the detention of Chinese laborers and to put them on the conveyor belt to deportation. Uh, and then it's really important for us to remember that uh, a justification for border expansion was uh, to construct uh, Mexican males as dangerous criminal rapists who were selling marijuana to school aged children and who upon smoking marijuana uh, were crazed with savage like tendencies and uh, tendencies to rape. Uh, and so we really have to uh, remember because again, we are, uh, this is, uh, we have to, disrupt the collective historical amnesia that has uh, strategically been forced upon us through our uh, school education. We have to remember that um, that uh, during the Mexican-American uh, War, during the uh, revolution in Mexico, uh, there was a lot of fear along the US-Mexico border of revolutionaries and that the Mexican Revolution would spill into the United States. Uh, there was fear of the spread of um, uh, communism. And so I'm just gonna read a little excerpt from, um, from a paper I wrote a few years ago um, that is based on uh, a book that I highly recommend for folks. It's called Drug Wars, The Political Economy of Narcotics by Curtis Mares. And um, yeah, and I think it's really important to emphasize this uh, 
history because we see the same rhetoric being used by the white supremacist dictator Donald Trump when he's uh, doing his campaign early in his presidential campaign uh, before uh, taking power. Um, he uses uh, the same sort of rhetoric uh, to uh, uh, and he casts that um, construct of drug smuggling rapists on Central American immigrants. Um, so after the Mexican-American War, the militarization of the U.S.-Mexico border and bringing of anti marijuana policy was further imagined in advance when many Mexicans dispersed north of the border during and after the Mexican Revolution from the 1910 to 1930s. Uh, the wave of new revolutionary immigrants sparked U.S. state discourses and practices over citizenship, border control, and state police power. The U.S. government adopted anti-communist and anti-drug discourses in order to legitimize policing the border and prevent the revolution from spreading into the U.S. In the 1930s, Mexican workers were commonly criminalized as drug smugglers and users. This occurred during Harry J. Anslinger's term as commissioner of the Bureau of Narcotics. He persisted in terrorizing the public of marijuana through the employment of incendiary racist language. He declared 50% of the violent crimes committed by Mexicans, Turks, Filipinos, Greeks, Spaniards, Latin Americans, and Negroes could be traced to the abuse of marijuana. Anti-immigrant sentiments can be further traced to 19th century subversive non-Anglo border culture. When the border was drawn at the end of the U.S.-Mexican War in 1848, Mexicans and natives used this freshly imagined incision as an opportunity to engage in profitable trade. They would cross the border to one side, raid settlements, and then trade the acquired loot, usually horses, captives, and guns. And it's important to recognize they were looting uh, settlers like a uh, Europeans, people of uh, European descent, Anglos, they were uh, robbing their settlements. Um, they would flee persecution by crossing the border to the opposite side. Ever since its conception, the authority of the border has been undermined by smuggling contraband. At the same time of the Mexican Revolution, while, whilst many Mexicans were unemployed, the cultivation and distribution of marijuana became a source of income that many Mexicans on both sides of the border. Large supplies of the plant were brought into the states through border towns and major cities. By 1928, hundreds of Mexicans in El Paso were employed as smugglers of cocaine, morphine, opium, and marijuana. They were recruited from the working class barrios of border towns and became a part of collaborative geographically dispersed labor networks within the informal sectors of the trans-border economy. Since Mexicans were organizing themselves to use the new border to their advantage, the United States continued to build a discourse in response to the threat of savvy entrepreneurial border crossing Mexicans. The organized groups of Mexican smugglers were compared to radical Mexican labor unions and the fact that weapons were simultaneously smuggled out into Mexico led United States. State officials to associate Oh, sorry. Um, this led state officials to associate these marijuana traffickers with Soviet revolutionaries. Um, so I could keep on reading, but um, I think something here to emphasize is that the borderlands were composed of guerrilla fighters, saboteurs, labor organizers, and strikers. Anarcho-syndicalists populating the area called for the formation of international proletariat solidarities in order to launch a millennial war against state-sponsored capitalism. They attacked private property, state protection towards it, promoted governance from the ground, advocated for direct actions such as general strikes, industrial sabotage, and violent confrontation. They encourage the collective ownership of property and a mutual aid ethic. So given that there is this radical history along the US-Mexico border, uh, we really need to understand why um, the war on drugs was designed to incarcerate people using uh, psychoactive substances uh, for uh, their economic resilience, uh, for thriving, for um, self-medication. Um, it's all been done strategically. I know that in New York, uh, the campaigns against uh, um, cannabis marijuana during uh, Harry Anslinger's term uh, was uh, in response to uh, the thriving uh, use of marijuana in jazz clubs and the uh, fear of um, interracial relations between black males and um, white females. And that was also used in the propaganda uh, against marijuana. Um, and I can talk more about immigration, but I'd love to hear from my colleagues as well. Okay, so I mean, actually, it sounds like 
we might have too much more to say on that particular topic. Um, but I will, you know, kind of like do sort of some closing remarks before we go into questions because there are a number of questions that I would like for people to have answered. Um, you know, so a lot of what we've been talking about this entire time you know, has been how a lot of these policies, how colonialism has impacted these communities, whether it's BIPOC communities or uh, migrant communities from day one into today. And, you know, a, a response that we've had from a n number of people um, to just to this series in general, is like a lot of people don't understand what systemic racism is. And it's a very difficult thing to answer because it's such a broad, it's just such a broad topic. And the, the, all of these examples are basically different ways that systemic racism exists. You know, having this 13th Amendment that uh, still allows slavery to occur, having all of these laws that, you know, bar access to healing, healing us psychoactive substances, having these biases in our healthcare, having these, you know, um, dis disparities in, in, in um, like a wealth gap that prevents you know, different communities, marginalized communities to access these services or, you know, educational, different educational opportunities that create a lack of diversity in healthcare and different systems that will then help address um, these marginalized communities. And with that, unless there's anything anyone would like to chime in about, I was going to then jump into some questions, which I think start to touch on uh, these topics. All right, so if there's nothing uh, else to be said on that, I would like to now start looking at the questions that have been voted up. So one of our top questions that we have here, which I think is extremely relevant to what we were just closing with, is Sammy asks, how can non-natives who have access, who, ac who access sacred medicines show up to decolonize their healing process? Um, yeah, I'm happy to answer that or to uh, start it out. Um, so I think it's absolutely necessary, especially for those who believe that we are all one and we are all one, uh, but that doesn't mean that we can ignore what's happening to our relatives who are incarcerated or who are forced to migrate or who are facing state violence uh, because of the extractive industries uh, waged by global capitalism. I think it's important for us to align ourselves in solidarity with those uh, most impacted and targeted by uh, these systems. So I think we all need to be participating in dismantling uh, prisons. We need to be uh, talking about what it means to act in solidarity with those who are persecuted by uh, immigration customs enforcement, uh, by customs and border patrol. We need to be talking about how we show up, how we redistribute our resources, and we need to be talking about reparations. Right now there's a federal bill and in some states there are bills at the state level to uh, operationalize reparations to be paid to folks of the African diaspora. So I think we need to get active and we need to get loud about these issues. And we can do that by talking to our, in our state government in California, we would be talking to our assembly members, our senators, and at the federal level, we, will, we would be talking to um, this, uh, we would be talking to our congressional representatives and our senators. Uh, so definitely get your meetings in with congressional staff. Uh, if, yeah, make that effort. Um, I think it's really important for us to talk about um, abolition and to think about the Underground Railroad. It's really important for us to understand how the Underground Railroad was in operation um, and to talk about how we participate in um, iterations of the Underground Railroad, because right now people are being terrorized by the detention deportation regime and people are being held in uh, immigrant prisons where um, the violent acts happening in their amount to crimes against humanity. There are mass atrocities happening in immigrant prisons. And because of what I shared earlier, we know that people are being forced to migrate because of the global arms trade that is so closely, uh, that is 
totally intertwined with the war on drugs and how the U.S. has exported the war on drugs to other countries. So uh, I think that we need to be opening up our homes uh, so that people can get out of uh, immigrant prisons and folks can uh, learn more about how to do this by visiting Freedom for Immigrants website and going to the Join Us tab and uh, clicking on Sponsor an Immigrant. Uh, we need to be collectivizing our resources to support people in their community integration processes upon being uh, released from these torture sites. Uh, and there is so much more that we can do. Uh, we can be uh, directing our money to bail funds. So you can go to the National Bail Fund Network and share your resources and really make a plan of how you're gonna be redistributing the resources that you do have access to. Um, and I could say more, but I would love to hear from, my, uh, from the other participants. Yes, yes, to all of that, yes. Um, and I'll, I'll add on some kind of, you know, I, I think of this question a lot in terms of, and I get this question a lot from my clients and from just everybody who knows me in regards to like, well, what, you know, what can I do as somebody who is not indigenous? How can I, what does true solidarity look like? What does um, land back really mean? What does rent is due really mean when I repeat these things over and over again? Um, and I want to say thank you to all my community members who are so patient with my constant answers for this. Um, and I'm actually going to share a, an article by Camille, who was supposed to be here, um, you know, and wasn't able to due to a, a, an emergency. And Camille has a way of describing uh, this this void that is experienced in whiteness that I think is critical to understand. So there's that. Um, so the violence of the void, I think, is something to be aware of for folks who are um, who I who identify as American, who identify as not being um, who not being indigenous to this land, and then having this experience often, not all the time, of like disconnect from um, indigeneity or from disconnect from their from their own culture, and that is something to be really aware of and and to be held with a lot of compassion. Um, and, I, and I know that I can also get into this place where I'm like both angry with that, right? Like as an indigenous person, like you don't, you know, and how many times I've been told to go back to my own country, which is complicated and fun to say this is my country every time that happens. Um, but with that void, right? What can we do with that empty space, that complicated place of grief of, I want to return back to the sacred. I want to have rituals, but I don't want to um, appropriate, right? Um, and what I would say is, you know, there's a couple things. One is, one is knowing that you have, you have rich, rich, beautiful history, your own indigenous cultures, you have your own ancestors, and they're not mine, but they're yours. And I would encourage in any way that is accessible to you to continue to explore those places. I would say a great place to do that is in therapy, truly. And I, I, I know I'm just also saying this in regards to a uh, you know, this job security for me. But I really do think like if you could to set a commitment to exploring intergenerational places, intergenerational trauma does not discriminate. And for a lot of folks, a lot of like European settlers and who are now American who don't know their motherland, um, to encourage like understanding where has the trauma also lived within the body, right? And acknowledging that a lot of um, European settler ancestors have experienced a lot of trauma. They were refugees from, you know, being uh, burned at the stake for a lot of indigenous practices of herbalism, of uh, different pagan rituals. And those rituals are magical and beautiful and can be really accessible and powerful. And really, they can, um, they can really support the healing that is possible within psychedelic medicines. And I would encourage that, you know, with my clients, whenever we do a, a any type of psychedelic integration or we do um, a psychedelic ritual um, whatsoever, we we set an altar up. And on that altar, I encourage them to bring um, different objects that will that will make the space sacred. And we have lots of conversations. All of my clients, who you know, a, a huge diversity in regards to my clients, like know that we we talk about decolonization often. We talk about um, you know, capitalism often the internalization of those concepts, and it's a constant. It's a constant thread, and we're not doing it just. This is not just happening between me and my indigenous clients. This is happening between me and my white clients, kind of more often than than not, um, because it's ultimately harmful to everybody. You know, so I would encourage that. I also encourage, um, you know, 
if if you do feel like a, there's a disconnect to um, your own like indigenous culture, I want to remind you that you get to become an ancestor. And I want to say this very clearly. Like if you feel disconnected and that is not accessible in any way, I, I my heart is broken for you in that place and I'm so sorry and I know what that's like, okay? But you still will be somebody's favorite ancestor and you get to intentionally create a place where seven generations from now, you have created a whole world of new rituals and new ways of showing up and new ways of dedicating yourself to these movements that will be embedded into the genetics of all of your descendants. And I'm looking forward to that day. I'm looking forward to my descendants and your descendants. And I guess that's where, you know, there's there's pain there. Um, we are we are our um, ancestors' wildest dreams in every way. The resilience is, lives within you. If intergenerational trauma exists, so does intergenerational joy. So does intergenerational wisdom. Um, so I'm encouraging that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Danielle. I like <laughs> almost had some tears like starting to water up there in my eyes, but uh, the show must go on. You know, like this, that, that void is real. Um, and you also mentioned the, the concept of intergenerational trauma. And I don't know if there's time to speak on this, but it's actually been scientifically studied on worms that there's, you know, set like these, these like traumatic, experiences are basically passed down from generation to generation, like within a genetic makeup. Danielle, would you like to expand on that a little bit more? Yeah, I actually just shared the article for the worms. Um, yeah, it, this is this is like the, the scientific background to epigenetics being an actual thing. And it's, it's uh, I want to encourage everybody to know that intergenerational trauma just simply exists we are embedded genetically with everything from our ancestors. So you have ancestors, okay? Um, the worm study is basically that, you know, I mean, to super extremely simplify it, you take one worm, you traumatize it, it has seven to 14 generations of babies. And it, within all of those babies, the, the trauma is embedded into the code, right? And so when we talk about settler colonialism, for both the, for the three, there's a triad in settler colonialism, it's settler, uh, settler, um, slave and indigenous, right? So w in all of those bodies, there's different traumas happening. And to this point in the day, we are still holding those traumas from our ancestors, right? So to be like, a lot of this is um, encouraging like somatic ritual. Um, we can go to therapy and intellectualize and process emotions through, through that cognitive realm. But one thing I can offer you from just indigenous practices and decolonizing psychotherapy is to kind of scrap that and acknowledge that these, these things cannot just be healed from intellectual processing, nor through just taking a pill, like in some form, just as, as we've been taught, we're great capitalists, we're great, uh, you know, settlers, whatever. But like, instead, that there's a huge part of emotional, spiritual, um, like, stuff that we have to acknowledge and just be a part of. So yeah, I, I'm sure you all know it the worm study is um epigenetics and everything but just to acknowledge that it's it's living within us and it's not it's not completely our fault but we also are responsible for healing yeah um yeah and i also wanted to thank you danielle that was beautiful i'm just like wow i don't i don't feel yeah you made me feel good it's good <laughs> um but I just wanted to add from like a practical perspective and from like a policy perspective because those are the realms that i like tend to reside more in um because of the violence and because of the history that a lot of these sacred medicines have like we have to acknowledge what current indigenous people that are still alive that are still protecting these medicines like what they want right and so um i think about how things like peyote are being over harvested right and yet we're seeing campaigns like decriminalized nature that are including language around the use of peyote without working alongside the native american church to see what exactly they would want with that specific substance, like what, how they would want that to be framed or how the education around that would, should be done. Um, so I think before engaging with any particular plant medicine, um, think about like, where, where is this coming from? Like where, what culture is this being extracted from? Is this being sourced fairly? Is this being 
harmful to someone's community? Is is my use as a non-Indigenous person taking away from someone who has, it, it, you know, it's part of their culture and they may not have access or have may, may have reduced access because of my use, right? So that's one place to start. Um, and also ed just educating yourself on, on the policies that continue to do this colonialism. Because if we're supporting policies that are saying, let's let's bring all the ayahuasca to the US, let's bring all the peyote into my house, even though I am a non-native person, like that is that is colonialism. We have to acknowledge what the indigenous people that hold these medicines want and then work in in relationship with them to write, write these policies, not say, oh, but I'm deserving of healing. I want healing now. That's that's colonialism and that's not how we decolonize. Um, so yeah, just wanted to add that in. Um, so really briefly, I just wanted to echo what Yarelix is saying and wanted to direct folks to the UN Declaration of Indigenous Peoples' Rights and acknowledge that there is a lot of room for critique there. But if you look at the 19th article, the 19th article is on uh, consent, uh, it's on consent, cooperation, oh, I'm forgetting the third one. But um, yeah, definitely look at the 13th article there it's on consultation. Okay, yeah, consultation. So yeah, echoing what Yarelix was saying, it's really important for folks to be in dialogue with um, uh, tribal leaders and uh, really understanding what uh, folks' access is to the medicine because we know with peyote it's um, endangered and we know with psilocybin right now, uh, there are uh, efforts to commercialize the use of psilocybin, um, but we, there's not consultation happening with uh, Mastatec peoples or other peoples who have historically used psilocybin in mushrooms and ceremonies. So we really need to be seeing more of this consultation processes and we need to respect whether consent is given or not given and cooperate with the decisions of indigenous people. Okay, great. I mean, these are all some really good points. Um, I did see a question in the uh, chat that I wanted to quickly address before moving on to our last question. Someone asked here, how can the psychedelic community not replicate, replicate these systems of oppression that we're speaking of? Um, I honestly just think that one of the biggest things that people can do is start actually like bringing in by PLC leadership or migrant leadership or whatever, like start getting these people. And if you're working with organizations, start putting them into like decision-making roles, you know, not like, don't think of it as a diversity hire. Like think of this as being like part of the core of your organization. Now, like you want to have basically like a BIPOC working plan or something so that you know that you need to be able to access these communities as a person who is, you know, trans, non-binary, queer, I have, in my organizations, I, I have a perspective and access to these communities that maybe other people don't because they don't identify there. And with that being said, I want to ask this question about healthcare that someone had posed. Um, so I lost it here. I said, as therapists, clinicians, advocates in the psychedelic field, has anyone considered the impact of housing medicalization through the current broken traditional rigid hierarch hierarchical medical model. For example, if only physicians can prescribe, what does this do for clients in rural and underserved communities without en enough doctors? Yet there aren't really any mention of any other model, for example, utilizing other advanced practice cl clinicians who are authorized to prescribe and practice independently in some states. It's something I've wonder been wondering about and how this will impact BIPOC in the long run, just like our current healthcare system. Yeah, I could just shoot off of that real quick. Real quick, um, that's a that's a beautiful and complicated question, and speaks to why the healthcare system is a business, and we need to remember that, right? And it also has disproportionately harmed uh, Black and Indigenous folks, and so there's a reason why people are going to distrust these systems when seeking really amazing healing experiences, even within psychedelic therapies, right? So uh, this is where I'm also going to um, to do a shout out for Sage Institute and it kind of being a place, what we're creating is a model that that it with hope can be replicated across um, 
across the country and it being more accessible, you know, even I've been playing with this idea and probably I pretty much haven't even told this to the stage folks, but like thinking of um, how to, for the folks who are in rural lands who can't access our services, like, is there a way in which we can cut some of their costs for therapy for travel, right? And this is what I'm saying is being really, really creative about accessibility, um, about um, reciprocity, about um, reparations and really like playing with what that actually means. And then also, of course, if we legalize all drugs, then we can have way more options for replication of psychedelic healing modalities that exist outside of the realm of psychedelic therapies. So we'd have to do that. But right now it's not safe to just encourage uh, black and indigenous folks to do their own healing because they are disproportionately more likely to be incarcerated, criminalized or killed for their use even though it can like be as powerful and empathetic of an experience as, as possible. So that's my point. Thank you. Yeah, I have something to add. So I think um, the medical care system is capitalist. The medical care system is dangerous and it's not made for BIPOC people. It's not made for a lot of different, a lot of the people that we've mentioned in this conversation. Um, and so I think before we're advocating for the integration of certain practices inside of the current medical system, like if we're going to say, oh, we're going to make psychedelic therapy like this, this little uh, office over here in this hospital that, you know, is, is racist as fuck to everyone. Um, we should first be talking about alternative models of how we can provide these services. Um, and if that alternative alternative model is like Sage, that they have a, a sliding scale and they have people of color and they have people that are that are reflective of the community. That's an amazing place to start. Another place that we can start is engaging with like current policies and looking at who the representatives that we elect are and if they support uh, Medicaid for all or healthcare for all um, and like advocating for healthcare for all because if we all have access to healthcare then that's at least like the the lowest hanging fruit is addressed. Um, but I, I mean I just think we need to get rid of this mentality that like the healthcare system is good or that the healthcare system is fine and we're just gonna like work into it because it's not. And if we collectively like try to figure out ways to dismantle that system too and create alternatives that feel safe for us, then that is a precursor to actually accessing all of these other therapies. All right, um, I think that's that's all the time we have, folks. I really want to thank everyone who's joined us on this call, especially if you had joined us for the first part of the series. We will have another uh, we will have another uh, continuation on this series scheduled for about two weeks from now. If you are you know here registered, then you'll be able to get updates about that. I also would like to thank all of our panelists here, Paula, Danielle, and your relics, um, and myself. I'm here. Uh, you know, for giving us such enriching information about all this. I think we, you know, were able to really collectively answer a lot of people's questions and leave you with a lot of food for thought. There have been a ton of resources shared in the chat. Uh, just know that we will collect all of these resources, these links, um, and gather them into a document and be able to like email those out to everyone who's been, um, so who subscribed to this series so that you can continue to do this research outside of that. And yeah, um, that's all we have time for today. Thank you. Bye everybody.